welcome all to the Q&A Cafe, to those of you watching at home or wherever on YouTube. Um, welcome to the Q&A Cafe and to Ron Kessler, welcome to the Q&A Cafe. Thanks for having me. We were just talking, um, I, you may not remember this, but I've known you since, I first met you when you were at the Washington Post. It was Bob Woodward who introduced us. I believe we had lunch one day actually, but I was just a little mm. squirt with UPI at the time. And, um, and then all these years later, um, we've kept bumping into each other and seeing each other and I had the Q&A start at Nathan's and I just always wanted you to do this. And I'm, I'm, I believe in serendipity to some extent in that when we finally get around to doing it, it's like a perfect storm of all the things you can talk about, mm. you know, because I mean, we've got the, the Secret Service, we've got Trump, <laughs> And, uh, and then I thought we'd start with something that just happened today, John Boehner. Mm. Do you, 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 I'm sure you, you know, you're a journalist, but given the, um, your politics, or at mm. least your perceived politics, I imagine you've mm. met him, know him, yes? Uh, I've done stories about him. Done stories people. about him? Yeah. So what's your take? Well, it's just so pointless because, of course. His yeah. resigning? No, his. Uh, the, the opposition to to John Boehner, which has just become endemic with, within the Republican Party on the right, uh, to the point where you know they, they, they boo whenever they hear his name. Uh, all he's doing is fighting with the fact that uh, that we have a Democratic president who would veto any bill, yeah. um, and uh, so all of this. Uh, brouhaha about, about him not being conservative enough is, is pointless. The whole idea of shutting down the government is pointless um, and uh, it just set, sets back the Republican Party. Um, did, did, you must have watched the Pope yesterday when he was speaking before Congress and, and, and Boehner was quite emotional. Do you think mm. now that we, we know what happened today that tells us something about how he was feeling yesterday? I think it may, it may have. I mean, we know he's given to tearing up, but that was, right, right. He, seemed, he seemed particularly emotional. Yeah, and he had a uh, private meeting with the Pope, and uh, I, I'm sure this all made him reflect more. Why, why does he need this job? Uh, why, it's, it's a thankless job, uh, and uh, he's been in a long time. Uh, he can do very well in the private sector. Uh, so I think it probably did precipitate this. Do you think it's necessary to resign? If you're going to resign the speaker's job, do you have to resign from Congress? Is that not extreme? No, no you can remain in Congress like uh, yeah. Nancy, right. Nancy so Pelosi. Why, that just seems extreme. It seems like mm. um, like there's, well, we'll find out, mm. of course, over the next several days, but it seems like there's much more. We'll find out when he does his book, which is very interesting. <laughs> Maybe he'll do his book. Maybe. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but you know, this week, uh, this week has been amazing and I, I kind of wanted to start with this week and the Pope's mm -hmm. protection because um, it was amazing to, to see the level of protection that we could see and I know there's a lot we couldn't see. But I also thought it was interesting, the juxtaposition of his little Fiat and, and our giant SUVs and of course the President's Beast and I wonder if there's if in some way that underscores the extent to which our level of security has perhaps grown outsized, out of control. Mm. No, given the threats, uh, our security I think could be even tighter and, and the fact that the Pope wants this fiat, uh, symbolic though it is, it, it is a big uh, threat to his security. Not only his security, but agents who are there to protect him. Uh, so uh, I don't I don't approve of that at all. But isn't he underscoring though to some extent that so much of it is you know you can have all the protection in the world but that's he says you know if it's God's will I'll you know that's what if I am somebody harms me that's God's will and so be it. Mm. And he's saying you know he's he's speaking to the importance of the simplicity and being in touch with the people. We've built such a this is a cliche but we've built such fortress around the presidency that, where does it stop? Well, look at what happened last fall when Gonzalez, the intruder, got, made his way right into the White House. He was armed with a knife, uh, could have taken out the president. He just left 10 minutes earlier. We don't want that. And you know, an assassination uh, really threatens democracy. It nullifies democracy. Mm -hmm. So it's not just you know, the Pope's life, it's also 
his, his church, his flock, uh, that would be devastated. Uh, and uh, you know, this, this sort of fatalistic attitude uh, is, is actually why John F. Kennedy lost his life. Because uh, in the case of the uh, Dallas motorcade, Secret Service agents wanted to ride on the re rear running board of his limousine. Mm -hmm. And he refused for the same reasons that the Pope doesn't like to have a lot of security. He just doesn't like the looks. It seems you know, uh, intrusive. He wants to be more accessible to the people. But uh, if those agents had been on the rear running board, when the first shot was fired, which was not fatal, they would have jumped on and pushed him to the floor, and he, uh, he would be alive today. The second uh, shot was fatal. So uh, we, we just do, do not need another assassination, whether it's the pope or, or a president. But it was the Secret Service who wanted um, Pennsylvania Avenue closed. And that didn't make it any safer at the White House. I mean, before Pennsylvania yeah. Avenue was closed, I don't know that we had the rate of fence jumpers that we have now. So, right. so what, what did that? Well, the Secret Service has been cutting corners and, and has been lax for many years, ever since Department of Homeland Security took it over in 2003. Was that a bad thing for them? I mean, was that, yeah, and, was and, that jarring? But mainly, yeah, but mainly it was, it was the leadership. I mean, before, in Treasury, it was sort of a crown jewel. Nobody messed with it. When it be, uh, went into DHS, it became more political. It had to fight more for budgets with these 22 other mm -hmm. national security agencies. But if you had the right leader, um, this, this would not have happened. And what happened was, in the case of the White House intrusion, I mean, just one screw up after another. First of all, uh, a, sp a spike at uh, the top of the, f no. the fence, which is a ridiculous fence that can be scaled, um, was missing. Nobody replaced it. So he used that particular uh, entry point. Uh, he went in. The radios were out of date. Nobody could hear anything. The, the Secret Service has this attitude that we make do with less. We're so proud. We're so arrogant. We don't need more money. We don't need to even ask for more money. Uh, and so they couldn't even hear each other mm -hmm. on the radios. Uh, one agent who had a, uh, a so-called canine unit, a dog, uh, was talking on his personal cell phone and a personal personal call. I think that also goes to the laxness, uh, the sense that uh, management cuts corners, so why, why shouldn't we? And then the White House door was, was not locked. You know. Now, is, that, is that standard operating procedure? Well, it's, and we're all it's, just finding that out for the first it's, time? It's typical of the arrogance of the Secret Service, that we don't need that, and we don't want to you know, uh, bother any, anybody. So therefore, why should we ask them to, to uh But did you, uh, did you find things? out whether there was, you know, whether it is required that at like 11 o'clock at night, after the president's gone to bed or something, somebody comes? Locks the door. Is there no, a key? No, until now, uh, it was it was left unlocked, uh, and then now I um, imagine it's got three locks. Hopefully, and then uh, in addition to all that, uh, alarms that would have notified agents and uniformed officers in this White House that there was an intrusion had been turned off by agents yeah. because the White House usher thought it was a bother that sometimes there were false alarms. Of course, again because of poor equipment, and so the agents caved and, and turned off the alarms. It's just like the bank manager at your local bank turning off all the alarms in the bank. Uh, he would be fired for that and maybe prosecuted. Just one thing after another. And, and uh, it's, it's something that uh, continues to this day, this corner cutting, this attitude. The new director, uh, Clancy, is an insider, has the same culture uh, that has led to all these problems. You don't like him. No. He was appointed Why by. Not? Well, um, he, he was appointed by Obama uh, because he trusted him because he'd been in charge of his own. But he was detail, a lifer, but, right? I mean, he'd been. That's right. His yeah. career was in the Secret Service. Mm -hmm. um, Obama should have listened to the recommendations of his own four-person panel, not, along with one of my books, that said that uh, <laughs> he should appoint an outsider, such as a former FBI official, who would shake it up, who would not be uh, beholden to interest within the agency. Um, and Clancy has shown himself to be a, uh, a cover-up artist. Recently, he said on CNN that there's no cultural problem in the, in the Secret Service. When he was asked in hearings uh, about uh, some of the issues, for example, when, when Gonzalez penetrated the White House, the Secret Service issued a statement saying that he'd been apprehended at the door yeah. and that he was not armed. Both were lies. Clancy was asked about this. 
you know, are you going to do anything about this? Are you going to hold these people accountable for lying? He said, well, that wasn't a lie. It was just an error. And then he was asked, well, how do you know? And he said, oh, I don't know. I don't know how this happened. So that's an example of this cover-up mentality that has led to all these problems. But on the other hand, doesn't Clancy deserve the credit for the good week the Secret Service has had with the Pope? Well, so far, we, don't, we have not had well, an assassination. Well, I mean, we certainly uh, <laughs> yeah, no, let's, no, let's it, not appears to be, it, right? You know, a well-executed plan. At least uh, the, so the Washington part is completed, and that I can't imagine that it could have gone any more smoothly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the Secret Service was in charge of the whole event, right? As a, a national and special security event. And they are in New York and Philadelphia Everything. too, as well. Yeah, 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 and that is an amazing job that they did. Was that um, was that an unusual step to have the Secret Service be in charge of something on that scale? No, um, there's this thing called National Special Security Event, which sounds... Is that since Homeland Security was uh, created? Well, it's a law that was passed by Congress uh, after, that's right, DHS was created. Yeah. And it, it designates the Secret Service to coordinate all security in these uh, special events, including uh, uh, a visit by the Pope, the inauguration, uh, the, okay. no, uh, the uh, nominating conventions, uh, so uh, that that is a very good. Uh, but this was step. a success they kind of needed, didn't they? I mean, <laughs> that's right. Now let's talk about the cool stuff we didn't see, um, because I was out on the street a few times when the Pope drove by, and mm -hmm. I was struck by how easy it was to just walk up and stand on the side of. The, I mean, yesterday I stood on the side of Rock Creek Parkway with four other people, and the Pope drove by, and it was just easy and. There was no sweat. I, I just think it's, nice. it's totally crazy. You know, Joe Biden has the same attitude. He, when he goes up to Wilmington, uh, he doesn't want to look like he has a big motorcade. He wants to be regular Joe, the guy. Well, see, man that's of the a people. good thing. And, um, but you don't think so. No. Uh, you know, it, you want of, them to be in a bubble. Well, first of all, you know, we, with the access that, that they have now to TV, to Twitter, every other yeah. uh, form of communication. It's not like the old days when, when you would never have any, any uh, access to the president. Nobody's actually going to walk into the Oval Office, um, but uh, you, have to, you have to have this basic security. In the case of Biden, uh, when he goes up to Wilmington, he insists that the military aid with a nuclear football, which would unleash uh, a retaliatory strike in case we're attacked yeah. by another country, remain at least a mile behind his motorcade. So if, but if, he's not alone. I mean, it's not like the guy with the football is just wandering by himself a mile behind the vice president. I right. Mean, he's with people. There's communication. He's with people. But if, if there were an attack and a bomb were taken out, we would be obliterated because there would not be time for the military aid with a nuclear football to catch up with Biden. And without that football, there's no way to unleash a, a retaliatory strike. So, you know, we have to have some common sense and, and, and worry about our own security. Uh, in the event we're taken out because of Biden, uh, this country would not exist. I mean, we, we, there would be some primitive people here and there yeah. existing, uh, you know, in I guess in you don't caves. think you should run for president. I think that is uh, a disqualifier, absolutely. A we're we're, we're going to get to the candidate that yeah. you are in favor of. But, 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 mm -hmm. but again, I just want to go back to the Pope uh, one because I think it's illustrative of the sort of high-tech real-world security in which we now exist. Mm -hmm. As I said, at the street level, it just seems so easygoing and um, intimate with the Pope. But I gather there were just layers that we were under a dome in some way, that there were just mm -hmm. layers of security we didn't see. What were they doing that we didn't see? Well, they were screening people with magnetometers uh, at various events. and uh, I wasn't. There you go. Um, and, but I mean, uh, it was just a motorcade coming up the street, and people just gathered. Yeah, but, but you know, you could have you been armed with, with a weapon, and you could have sh shot the Pope very easily. And, and along but didn't with, they have along people in the agents. crowds like that? I could have been standing next to a a but it, it would happen so quickly, right you know. Yeah. Um, there'd be no time to 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 take you out. Yeah. Uh, that's what people don't understand about about uh, police shootings. You know, it, I, I've been to the FBI Academy where they have uh, a video where a shoot, don't shoot scenario uh, mm -hmm. unfolds, and and you have to 
determine within a second whether to shoot this guy, and and it's almost impossible. I mean, have it, you it, gone through the training? Some of it, have you? I, I have been uh, trained in in uh, firearms along with my wife Pam. Yeah, out at the Secret Service facility or just uh, privately? I've been at the Secret Service facility, but the training where is it? Was it FBI Academy? Uh, that is in um, let's see, uh, Beltsville. Okay. Uh, but it's actually Laurel. They call it Bellsville, but it's Laurel. Well. And by the way, my, my wife Pam uh, you know, is a former Washington Post reporter who accompanies me on a lot of these yeah, visits good. and describes vividly uh, some of the scenes in, uh, for the books. And we've got two of your books right here, The First Family Detail, which is the most recent, and then The President's Secret Service. And these are just the most recent in a long line of books that that mm. you start you, you left the Washington Post when? In 1985. 1985. You went to the Wall Street Journal. The other way around. Other way around. Yeah. But you but you left daily print media to become an author. Yeah, yeah. It was very and, risky. Uh, and your first book was the insurance industry. Right. And which I mean you, you we, we could we could talk for hours. You've got so many subjects mm. because your first book was the insurance industry. You've done a couple of books on Russia. Mm -hmm. And spy intelligence and intelligence. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're generally intelligence. CIA, security, FBI, but, uh, but, um, mm -hmm. but what is it? Twenty books now, mm -hmm. altogether. Yeah. What's the secret? Um, the you secret is that I like secrets. Uh, the secret is <laughs> that uh, I <clears throat> I like a challenge. You know, if the if the subject is too easy, I don't want to do it. And at the same time, a subject that is important and FBI, CIA. Secret Service, what could be more important? Uh, agencies that, that on the one hand are <laughs> responsible for protecting us, but at the same time can veer off in the wrong, di wrong direction, can yeah. engage in abuses. Uh, and, and I'm able to get the cooperation of these agencies. Usually I waterboard them, and that works very well. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that I'm able when to- When sodium pentothal doesn't work, right? Right. <laughs> in the case of the Secret Service, on the one hand, uh, uh, go out to the training center, interview the director, uh, uh, interview one of their canine units, one of their dogs, uh, see the, where the uh, presidential limousine is kept in the basement, but at the same time, free to uh, criticize if, if, if warranted. And you do. And one of my books led to the dismissal of Sessions, William Sessions yeah. as FBI director over his abuses. You like to shake it up. Um, mm. Tell me about this building that's on, I think it's 22nd Street off of M. Secret Service building. What's mm. in there? I had heard that's where they kept the beast. Where do they keep the beast? Which is the president's yeah. limousine. Yeah, I believe that is some for some vehicles, but but the beast is generally kept in the basement of Secret Service headquarters, uh, on which which I visited. Or, yeah. yeah, 18th Street. On 8th Street. I, yeah, and, by, by L. And yeah. uh, they polish it there. They have uh, this. Is there more than one? Uh, there's one presidential limousine, no, there are actually two presidential limousines, but in addition there are other limousines, and uh, the president may not be in one of those limousines. He may be in a, an SUV. The way behind. they do the helicopters, the marine, the three helicopters that land, yeah. well, not all three land, three helicopters approach the White House, one lands, and mm -hmm. then when it lifts off, three helicopters, you know, it's three helicopters again in the convoy. Yeah, it's, it's a, a decoy uh, mechanism. Is that frequent? Uh, yeah, especially if there's any threat out there. Or I mean, if he flies to uh, another country mm. or where, anywhere he goes, mm. do they take both uh, limousines? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they take, oh, my God, they, you know, they take uh, so many vehicles. They have cargo planes. Uh, and typically, 600 people go along on these. But visits. in cities like New York, do they just mm. keep a fleet there so that they when, do. when it's a city that the president's going to go to frequently, they don't? Well, yeah, they do, but, but the presidential limousine will, will be flown in. Uh, because that is a you know super super duper uh, uh, outfit uh, has its own sealed oxygen supply system. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I know. It, what does it weigh? Do you know? Don't know, but it's it's like a truck. It's basically a, a truck chassis, and then the the uh, limo uh, body is put on top of it. Uh, the the uh, doors are eight inches thick, uh, totally bulletproof. And um, but you asked about preparations uh, in the case of uh, a presidential visit, let's say, he goes to a hotel, the Secret Service will make sure that nobody's on that floor and nobody's on the previous, uh, on Above the top or below, yeah. and below floors. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they will uh, uh, screen for explosives, for bugging devices. 
Um, they'll look for uh, escape routes. The idea is, you know, if there's an attack, you don't want to just have the president there and have a shootout. You want to evacuate, as I yeah. say, get the president out of there. In an ideal world, he would never be exposed to people, right? <laughs> <laughs> From the Secret Service point of view. Well, you could say that. Um, that that, that, that is that. the attitude. That's always the attitude. That but, but let's talk about that attitude because it seems to me mm. that the attitude that the cha that a change came during the Clinton administration, that up until then, um, the Secret Service had been one kind of Secret Service, very um, discreet, and you didn't, you certainly didn't hear about them gossiping. Mm. And then two things seemed to happen when, um, when Clinton came into office. One was the preponderance of gossip that began, kind mm -hmm. of trashing the first family behind their backs, you know, leaking their secrets out. Um, I, that, that, that was, I, don't, I didn't recall that ever happening before. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was so much so that just people like me who weren't even writing a book might go to lunch with a friend who had connections to the Reagan or Bush administrations and they'd be saying, oh, let me tell you what the Secret Ser my Secret Service friend is telling me mm. about what's going on. And uh, that was something new. That had mm. never happened before. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing was what I'd already mentioned was where the Secret Service seemed to get more power over the president. Mm -hmm. And being able, like after the plane flew into the White House, that little plane, and it, wasn't it after that that they closed Pennsylvania oh. Avenue? Yeah. So what, mm -hmm. what caused this change, if, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. that these changes happened during mm -hmm. the Clinton years? You know, the Secret Service was not responsible for, and agents in particular, were not responsible for any of those rum uh, rumors or leaks at that time. You know, maybe someone heard something third hand from an agent, and sometimes I make up things. But in terms of actually getting interviews, I, I was the first to, to actually get interviews with agents about the protectees. And that was in this book, uh, which came out in 2009. Why would they talk to you? Um, I mean, isn't, besides, that, isn't that just goes against everything about their code? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, first of all, they feel that I have a good track record of telling an honest story uh, when an agency like the FBI does a good job. I say that. They haven't, we haven't had a, uh, a successful foreign terrorist attack since 9-11. I say that, which is so unusual in today's journalistic world to, to actually say something honest like that. And then on the other no, you, you don't hear that at all. And then on the other hand, as I said, uh, when, when they screw up or when William Sessions engages in abuses, I'd say that, and then he was fired. Uh, also, I'm genuinely interested in how they do their work. I did the first uh, uh, story on FBI profiling, criminal profiling. Yeah, in fact, and your books are often called Inside, Inside the CIA, yeah. Inside the FBI. So I think they appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I'm totally non-political. Non uh, this book, The First Family Detail. I, I don't know if I entirely believe that, but. Um. Well, The First Family <laughs> Detail, for example, uh, says that uh, Hillary Clinton treats her agents in such a nasty way. Know, you're that so if, terrible about Hillary, though, that it's, it's, like, it's almost difficult to, uh, that, that, to not well, laugh. This is the truth, um, that being assigned to her detail is considered a form of punishment. But on the other hand, the book says that Obama and his wife, Michelle, treat their agents with honesty and respect. And, and consideration. Well, you know, is that? Did they always say that? Was it a learning curve? Were their relationships no, no, something no. that had to develop? No, they treat them with respect. They were decent people, and they treat them with respect. And I, I say that in the book. So how could I, you know, be be uh, political? Um, but you are. You you would admit you are. Well, I, we all have our political opinions, yeah. and and uh, uh, but but the books are non-political. What did Lloyd Grove call you? Did he call you a, a light Republican or? I said, you know, that that. that <laughs> I forget, do you remember what he said? He did, he wrote a very nice piece about you in the Daily Beast, and for yeah. Lloyd, that was really something. Yeah, you know, yeah, so, people uh, were amazed. I think it's because he likes my wife, Pam, because we were both <laughs> at the Washington Post. Right, Post yeah. well, but, but has also, a soft side, too. Also, the, the, um, the book reveals that the Reagan White House staff was responsible for the shooting of Reagan because they insisted that uh, the Secret Service not have screening of uh, spectators when he came out of the Washington Hilton. And so Hinckley was able to shoot him. And, and that had never come out before. Yeah. Obviously, uh, non, uh, 
you know, an anti-Republican uh, disclosure. I also have negative material. I didn't material. get all riled up about Bradley Cooper going to the White House correspondence. Yeah, this is an example of the, uh, of the uh, culture within the Secret Service, yeah. because when Bradley Cooper went to the uh, White House Correspondence Center to see Obama speak, uh, a high-ranking uh, Secret Service official in New York, in New York ordered yeah. agents uh, to let Bradley Cooper and his SUV with him the secure area in front of the hotel where only yeah. Secret Service vehicles were allowed, and even they had to be screened for explosives. And it was just a favor to his security people. Uh, you can imagine the impact on the agents. Well, we saw this happen with the Salahis. I mean, the, you know, there was blame all the way around with the Salahis, but well, clearly uh, in that there case, was uh, an intimidation level that um, exactly. both and the agents and the social office, you know, just. Well, it, was, it was the Secret Service, and, the and an anecdote will explain why, and that is. Uh, when Mary Cheney, a Republican, one of uh, Cheney's uh, daughters, was under protection. She tried to get her agents to take her friends to restaurants. Well, they're not taxi drivers. What do you mean? Like Uber? Come pick yeah, them up exactly. and just, yeah, hey, yeah, hey yeah. my friend Joe wants to yeah. go over to Clyde's like tonight. Can you go pick right, him up right. and take him? <laughs> you know, they, they, they are mandated by law to protect certain people, and that yeah. doesn't include no. driving uh, friends to, ta to restaurants. And so. The agents refused, as they should have, but she threw a fit and got her detail leader removed over that. And so what message does that tell yeah. the agents at the gate, the uniformed officers mm -hmm. at the gate? It says, if we turn away this glamorous couple, and it turns out they were supposed to be on the guest list and it was a mistake, we could be in trouble with our own management, who will not back us, just the way they didn't back uh, the detail leader with Mary Cheney. Speak, speaking of people who have protection, Hillary Clinton has protection right now. Right. Arguably, she's probably the only presidential candidate who does at this so point, far. right? So far, yeah. Has she, has, has peace been made? If, if, if mm. it's true that the Secret Service didn't like working with her, has peace been made and she's got agents who... In no, no, she, she, you know, she's just a, a nasty person who, <laughs> who enjoys uh, you know, making the lives of the so-called little people that she claims she's going to champion if she's president miserable. That's, that's a well, fact. Well, we all have different personalities. Mm. Who knows how any of us, I mean, I, I find mm. it very uh, difficult to judge because I just don't know how any of us would behave if we had to live in that kind of security bubble that becomes a lifestyle when you enter mm. into, you know, the highest levels of a political life. You know, you know this the, is a sign of character. It, it, it's a, a warning sign. You know, in the case of Richard Nixon, we had a warning sign, which was he gave his, uh, he, he became in, involved in the ethics episode that led to the checker speech. And sure enough, we got Watergate. These are things that we look at in our daily lives. We wouldn't choose someone as a friend or even an employee at McDonald's if they treated other people yeah. in such a shabby way. But, 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 you know, I know that the, I know that the mandate of the Secret Service is to protect and, and affect the job before the, you know, it's not about the person, but you know, we're all humans. And if, if you really don't like someone, because the other part of the code of the Secret Service is you've got to be prepared to give up your life for the person you're protecting. Sure. How, how do you do that? How do you be willing to give up your life for somebody if you don't like them? Well, they're very professional. And, and, and they really would uh, absolutely give up their lives. I mean, are there, psych do, in, the, in the process of training agents, mm. is there a component of it that's psychological and about how to learn to, to shelve your personal feelings, how to, to, to not bring that into the job? It's sort of understood. It's not, not necessarily part of the training, but you know, uh, it, it's understood that, that this is what you have to put up with. This is, this is, uh, but if you're too opinionated, will you get will you get pulled? I mean, they, I would imagine mm. the Secret Service doesn't want to see agents being openly opinionated about the people they're protecting. No, no. And in fact, after I broke the story of the uh, prostitution scandal in Colombia, they required all. We don't have a long enough show for that. <laughs> they required all agents to sign a confidentiality agreement. Before that, it was understood. Uh, but that doesn't stop the corruption. That's just signing an agreement not to talk about it, right? Well, you know, they really don't talk about it very much. I mean, I, they talk to me, and, and, and that's about it. Uh, when it comes to actually describing what, what protectees are like, and this is, you know, this is a real story of our leaders. This is what they really are like. They parade on, the, on stage for the cameras. Uh, they, they, they're actors, and, uh, and the reality is uh, often very different. But isn't that so many people, don't we, 
all have some version of ourselves that we parade publicly? Well, and, we, you know, we, we can. And if, and if we had the scrutiny behind the scenes, mm -hmm. I mean, imagine if I brought my son mm -hmm. and the things he'd say about me privately at home. It would be. I mean, I'm just. Mm -hmm. It's. It's a. It's a. It's a tough. It's a tough line to walk, but. But to, who, who are the people who join the Secret Service? Are they predominantly men? Are they getting greater numbers of women now? Is there more diversity than before? Who are they? Did, did they apply to all three, FBI, CIA, and Secret Service, but they only got into the Secret Service? Are they would-be military, former military? Who, who are they? Yeah. Typically, about a third are milita former military. About a third are former police officers, and about a third are Neither, um, and uh, you know, generally they, they have their eye on the Secret Service uh, first and foremost. Others want to go to the FBI, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, just just by definition, someone who uh, agrees to take a bullet. The FBI requires a law degree, right? No, that's yeah. a, a myth that okay. J. Edgar Hoover uh, I'm glad I asked. Created. I, yeah, okay. It was never actually true, um, but uh, does the Secret Service require a degree? It does. So you have to have uh, four college, years of college? Right, college mm -hmm. degree. Um, and, um, uh, but someone you know, who understands that they may have to take a bullet for the president, by definition, is going to be a patriot. You know, not many people want to agree to that. Uh, so that, that immediately gets a lot of very brave uh, people, mm -hmm. uh, dedicated people. And um, so that's that's part of the story. How how many how many are on the staff of the Secret Service? And since they left Treasury, am I correct that mm -hmm. they're all just in the protection business now? There's no more Treasury business, or um, do they still no. do that? They still do counterfeit investigations okay. and other financial crimes. They keep expanding their jurisdiction. They always like to. Uh, you know, get a bigger budget for those things. I don't know why, because you know, with Washington. <laughs> yeah, but, but how many? How many are on staff? Uh, well, agents about two thousand, and about fourteen hundred uniformed officers, and uh, total employees about six thousand altogether. And how many? Do you know the number of how many people today have Secret Service protection? Well, there are about forty-seven in the White House. Uh, some of it is partial protection, like just going. Uh, Forty-seven work. people at yeah. the White House. I see. That's right. Round the clock. Well, in the White House and and cabinet officers, some okay. cabinet officers as well. Round the clock. Uh, some, most of them, round the clock. State Department's their own security, though, right? Right. right. And yeah. I imagine defense is their own security. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she had protection by the State Department during the day, and at night, the Secret Service would would do it. So they would. Did they work well together? I mean, the Secret Service yeah. and State. Yeah, they did. And, but, but, out, but people like um, we have Jimmy Carter and his wife get Secret Service. Do their children still get Secret Service? No. After the age of 18, they don't, although the, pre the sitting president can extend it if necessary. Uh, for example, if they're going to college, he may extend it. Uh, and by the way, speaking of Jimmy Carter, uh, he was so nasty <laughs> to his agents <laughs> that uh, he actually... But you want to talk about <laughs> He would actually tell his agents not to say hello to him in the, mor in the morning on the way to the Oval Office. He would pretend to carry his own luggage in front of the cameras, but it was actually empty, or he would give it to A's to carry. The book also says that Ted Cruz and, and uh, uh, Rand Paul uh, will show up for interviews at Fox News with five or six fawning aides in tow, whereas most members of Congress just have one or two. So again, here are these people who claim they're uh, against government waste. Uh, with with this whole entourage uh, when they go for interviews. The agents who um, end up uh, working for, say, former presidents, and I'm thinking like, let's say, George W. Bush and then his father and their wives, are they agents who have reached a certain amount of seniority and probably aren't going to come back into um, you know, working in protection for the current White House? Mm -hmm. Are they typically agents who are already working with um, that president when they were in the White House, how how did how does it? Because it's a real huge lifestyle change, I would imagine. You're going to be leaving mm -hmm. Washington and probably living where that president has gone to retire, yeah. or like with Nancy Reagan, where she's gone to retire. Are these considered plum jobs, or are these considered one one step toward retirement yeah. jobs? You know, it depends on the individual. Some some, of course, want that. 
uh, some want to go to a particular uh, place, whether it's Dallas or, or whatever. Um, the, the, the whole uh, uh, scheme when you join the Secret Service is you begin in field offices, you learn to do investigations. Field offices also do protection when the president is in town or mm -hmm. uh, candidates in town. And then you, you go into the uh, uh, president's detail or the vice president's detail, mm -hmm. and that would include the first family. Um, and then uh, you may go to headquarters, you may uh, go to a, uh, a, a former president. So it works in that, in At that way. At what point do the candidates get protection the, for the 2016? This is sort of a cat and mouse game. Um, the decision is made by the Secretary of Homeland Security with consultation with leaders of Congress, the top leaders of Congress. Um, and it's, first it depends on basic support, as shown by polls and money. But beyond that, it also may depend on just being asked. Uh, Barack Obama asked for protection earlier than anybody, and they did give it to him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Donald Trump has not. He has his own security. Uh, I, I think that's a little risky. I do. Um, you simply can't replicate the protection um, by the Secret Service. But again, these you know political types. Well, because also uh, if you have your own security, they're not going to be. Should I? I don't. I mean, on the same frequency with the established order. Right. You know? Right. They're not going to. You know, know about threats immediately. They're not going to uh, have the same kind of training. But I'm going to. I'm going to let you be our Donald Trump whisperer, <laughs> and uh, because you know you've been very public about mm -hmm. feeling he should be president. Not should. I mean, I like some Could. other. I, I like some <laughs> other candidates, but uh, I, I do think he'll be a good president. Shocking as that sounds, and and the reason is that I, I have a particular window on, on him. That, because of your book about Palm Beach. Right, and and ever since I've been uh, in touch, I've been a friend. Yeah. I've, when I've did you last access, speak to him? Um, a few weeks ago, uh -huh. and um, and. I interviewed Norma Forder, who was I his... I remember her. There you go. I used to deal with, when I was with Larry King, that, I mean, I talked to Norma a lot, because yeah. we would have Donald on a lot, but... She was his top aide for 26 yeah. years. She did yeah. everything, PR, uh, negotiating She was very likable, you know? Very professional, mm -hmm. and um, knew him better than anybody on both the business and social side. And she said, on the record, that there are two Donald Trumps. One is what you see on TV, where he is outrageous, makes provocative statements to get attention for his yeah. brand and now for his campaign. And the, on the other hand, the real Donald is totally different, is responsible for his business success, uh, totally rational, totally uh, savvy, uh, treats employees with great respect. Uh, for example, uh, his butler had a heart attack. He insisted that he stay at Mar-a-Lago, his home oh, in, nice. in Palm Beach. Uh, also, when we were going down on the plane with him, to spend the weekend at Mar-a-Lago for my book on, the, mm -hmm. on Palm Beach, the season. Uh, he, he was imitating the, the uh, sounds of uh, the Blue Bloods, the old guard in Palm Beach, uh, condemning him mm -hmm. for admitting blacks and Jews to his club, Mar-a-Lago. Two clubs in Palm Beach to this day do not admit right. blacks or Jews. Well, you talk about Norma Federer, who was this very um, pleasant face of the Donald Trump organization. How do you explain Michael Cohen, who gets a lot of airtime now as sort of his spokesman, I guess, you would, but isn't he his lawyer? Or? One of his lawyers. He's, he, he's he has a whole panoply of lawyers. Yeah, so what do you think of him? You know, l luckily <laughs> I don't have to deal with anybody except for Donald, um, and I don't have to defend. Uh, I guess that's an answer. <laughs> e either either employees or, or, or some of the statements he's made. I, I just tell, you know, as a reporter, right. I love to tell the inside story that others can't get. Are you going to write a book about the Trump campaign? Well, right now, you know, Donald's on TV 24 hours a day. I don't think that would sell very well. Um, How far do you think he's going to go? I, I think it's possible he'll, he'll keep going. Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know. We'll see. I think what perplexes people, especially in a city like Washington, where we live among politicians and people who run the country, you know, whether whether you like them or not, uh, even even some of the most aggravating come with specific details, specific ideas, specific solutions, um, and he seems to think that's not necessary. Mm -hmm. I mean. He loves to say, I'm going to make America great again. I could say I'm going to make America great again. But does that qualify me? I mean, I'm just yeah. 
Tell us. Yeah. How does this? Well, I, I think people get a sense that because you know he's he's he attacks uh, people right and left. Uh, he'll even attack Fox News. That's, that somehow that he's going to be a strong leader who would stand up to other countries, which would fear us. Uh, stand but, up is one word. Bully is a word some other people might true, use. True. You know that uh, um, might antagonize them in a way that's yeah. Yeah. So let me ask, since you like to do inside and behind the scenes, is there a behind the scenes to Donald Trump right now that we're not seeing where he's actually reading books, reading papers, getting briefed, learning the heart and soul of how things run and how we do things? I think his attitude is <coughs> that um, you know when he's confronted with a particular problem and needs to solve it, he will do it the way he has with his his whole empire. I, I've seen him in with his architects, his lawyers. Uh, he, he gets into the nitty gritty details. He'll he'll take a sharpie and he'll indicate where he wants a window. Uh, he will. I went out with Pam with him to his go new golf course in mm -hmm. West Palm Beach. He. Uh, chose personally the color of rock that he wanted for the waterfalls. He asked the workmen which color they like. He asked us which color we like. Uh, and he went with, with a particular color, uh, a, a red tone. That's the way he actually operates. Um, but you know, look at Richard Nixon. Uh, when he was running, he said, I have a secret plan to end the Vietnam War. Never said what it was. Donald is, is a, a, a marketer, and, and that's what he's doing, he's marketing. But, you know, he says things like, um, I learned what I know about foreign policy from TV. Yeah. I, you know, where, where do we go with that? You know, it's just, you, you don't want, mm -hmm. that's not what you want to hear from somebody who thinks they want to run the country. And I just wonder mm -hmm. at what point does he feel he needs to become more believable? Do you, mm -hmm. I keep expecting him to say it was all a joke. Yeah. Uh, and you obviously don't think so. No, so. I, yeah, I understand that. And, uh, you know, many of my friends and family members have the same view. Um, I just feel that, you know, there's a different Donald. Uh, and, uh, you know, he does have some advisors that he, that he consults uh, on military matters. But, but um, you know, so it happens you, that people on TV are often very, very uh, educational. <laughs> do, do you ever feel that you've been cast in, in a way as uh, Donald Trump's Landy Davis? Uh, I don't think so because you know, for example, in, in, uh, as you could see in that Lloyd Grove column in yeah. the Beast, I, I said I don't agree with him on what he said about Megyn Kelly. I thought those questions during the debate were perfectly fair. Uh, so I'm, uh, I do show my independence, um, and uh, you know, I think my track record speaks for itself. What would a Donald Trump presidency be like? How could somebody who is used to because this is much greater money. I guess Kennedy was the richest president we've had in our lifetimes, correct? True. So, and, and Donald Trump's far better off than JFK was. Uh, with a much, you know, he's, I mean, he's got, a, he's got an empire that he runs. He's a mogul, he's a business mogul. How does somebody like that come and fit into the White House? And, I'm, and I don't mean, because I think the job is bigger than any mogul, but, but I'm talking about just the, practical aspects of the lifestyle that you have to adapt to, you know, it goes right down to, does he, does he become president and say, I'm not going to need the Secret Service, I'm going to use my own security, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, how, yeah. how, have you thought about I, that? I think he, he's, he's very... Has he talked about that? Uh, you know, I've said that he should get Secret Service protection, but he doesn't listen to me. Doesn't listen to anybody, really. I mean, he, he, do, he does his own thing. Um, and if he asked for Secret Service protection, would they give it to him? Is he that kind of I think uh, they would. volatile a personnel or that kind yeah, of figure yeah, that, for uh, that for that reason? And that's really the measure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I, he's he's very adaptable. He likes to reinvent himself. You know, we, uh, he became a, a big uh, TV star, and and uh, he, he's gone through various phases. Uh, and I think he likes the idea of of uh, a new challenge, different yeah. lifestyle. Um, he, he would still have his little toys that he can go to, um, and he still has his beautiful. I mean, wife. instead of Marine One, would he use his helicopter? <laughs> no, I think he would, he would use you know, Air Force One and and all that. Um, the question is, uh, would he go to Mar-a-Lago as often? Typically, he'll go uh, every weekend during the season. Well, the press corps would probably enjoy they would like that. Yes, yes, Palm Beach for a. Um, well, you know, if nothing else, if, if, he doesn't, uh, if he doesn't go the distance, 
Um, he, he will be very much on Pennsylvania Avenue uh, probably by the time of the inauguration. I don't know what the timetable is for the hotel, but uh, what's your next What's your next project then if it's not true? I wish I knew. I don't have an idea for the next book. So you're just rolling through I'm, life. I'm doing publicity for the books yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, but it, it's very hard to come up with the right idea. It has to be, especially in this day and age of, of the internet, uh, it has to be something that, that's really going to have big pizzazz, yeah, that big tough. media pick up. But I also want it to be something that, that, that is secret, that's important. Uh, so uh, a lot of a lot of well, maybe uh, requirements. ISIS. And, <laughs> you know, so many things are, are, so many subjects are things that we read about every day or the next day. Yeah. And so uh, by the time the book comes out, it's not right. going to be interesting. Right. Well, um, your books are on Amazon. They're on your website, ronaldkessler.com. Mm -hmm. i so so happy that we finally got to do this and appreciate your coming to talk to me. Thanks. And, uh, Thank you for coming to the Q&A Cafe, and thank you, Ron. Thanks for the great questions. Yeah. <laughs>